Hi, my name is Bob German, and this video is Building a Conversational Bot for Microsoft Teams, Part 2. In the last video, I showed you how to use Lewis, a language understanding intelligent service, to predict what a user is asking the bot to do and to extract information called entities from the request. In this video, I'll show you how to work with dialogues so that you can interact with the user to determine exactly what the user wants. I'll show you how to use a waterfall dialogue to fill in any missing information and disambiguate the user's request so that it's possible to actually update a line of business system or otherwise act on what the user is asking the bot to do. So let's dive in. Now you may recall from last time that there are different kinds of conversations in Teams and different best practices for building bots depending on if it's a Teams channel conversation where the um, conversation is threaded and you have to add, mention the bot versus a group conversation versus one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of back and forth dialogue is really best suited for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Here's an example. I'm entering my hours as a consultant and I just put it in my own language and the bot understands and goes ahead and bills the client. Or if I leave out information, the bot will prompt me for anything that's missing. So here I left out the project name and there were actually two projects for Contoso so it disambiguates and then it asks me for every other detail that it needs until it builds up the request which can now be billed to the back end. So in the last video you learned how Lewis works, the language understanding intelligent service. To take an utterance like today I worked three hours on the Contoso project and turn it into a predicted intent and entities. Assuming we have an idea of the intent, we can prompt the user for any missing entities or any ambiguous ones, which is a lot better than just giving the user an error and making them start again. Finally, we want to build up the information we need to do the requested action. In this case, that information is in the white box on the right. We need the project ID, number of minutes, and the date the work was delivered in order to bill the client. Recall that bots interact in the form of turns. So if your bot gets a message, it's going to come in the form of an HTTP POST request from the bot channel service. You could reply with other messages or not, but as soon as you respond to the original HTTP request, you're done. The turn is done. And assuming load balanced stateless web servers, which is always the goal, you will forget everything about the conversation. So it's important to use bot state, and in this case we're using the conversation state, which could be stored in memory, Azure Table Storage, Cosmos DB, or in a custom provider, to store pointer to where we are in the conversation. This is done through the bot SDK concept of dialogues. For example, suppose I said, I want pizza and the bot responded what kind. It needs to know because it doesn't have the entity value for the flavor of pizza. So I say pepperoni. Now if another web server happens to get that utterance, pepperoni, what am I talking about? How does it know that I'm ordering a pizza? It's a dialogue that's going to orchestrate the turns and correlate the information so that it will remember that we're talking about a pizza order here and that pepperoni is one of the flavors. Then it can respond with another piece of missing information, large or small. I can answer and ultimately the dialogue can complete when it finally has all the necessary information. There are a lot of built-in dialogues in the bot SDK. You can see on the right text, number, date, time, these are all dialogues that just go and prompt the user for one piece of information and return it back to the caller. These are all called prompt dialogues. The other two major types of dialogues are waterfall dialogues which lead the user through a sequence of steps and that's what we're going to use in this case or component dialogues which are general purpose empty dialogues that you can do what you wish. So now let's look at the code that actually prompted the user for all those missing values and disambiguated the project. 
If you'd like to look at the code or try it out for yourself, it's at aka.ms slash consultingbot. Okay, so let's start here at the beginning in the startup class in the consulting bot. And what you'll see if I scroll down a little bit on line 43, I'm going to actually configure memory storage for bot state. So the bot's going to store its state in memory, which is fine for development, but wouldn't work if I wanted um, it to remember things across restarts or across multiple web servers. In that case, I might use table storage or Cosmos DB. Then I'm going to create user state, so keeping track of the state of the users of the bot and conversation state. These will be passed into the bot using dependency injection. So you can see them here coming into the constructor of the bot. Conversation state, user state coming in. And now what I'm going to do is override the onturn async function, which gets called when, by the bot framework whenever a new activity comes from the channel. The first thing it's going to do is on line 46, it's going to call the base class, which will actually dispatch this out to any one of a number of different functions depending on what kind of activity it was. So is it a message activity, an invoke activity, or a conversation update activity, or something else? Then I'm going to save the state. So this is really important, right? After I've handled any of these types of activity, I want to make sure that I write the state back to any persistent um, database that might be storing the state. So that's what's going on in line 49 and line 50. So dialog, the dialog system and my code can just update the state and know that it's eventually going to be updated at the end of the turn. So here's my on message activity async where I handle message activities. And you can see there's not a lot going on. I'm just going to run the dialog that was passed into me. And, and in this case, that dialog is the main dialog. So here's the main dialog, and if you look at its constructor, you might notice that it's going to create all the child dialogs that it might use. Now this is required by the bot SDK. The SDK will serialize and deserialize the entire hierarchy of dialogs and all their state for you, which is just wonderful. But they do require that you instantiate um, all of the child dialogues in each constructor so that basically when it calls the constructor of your root dialog, it's going to eventually build the entire um, hierarchy for you right there on the spot. Um, that way you can control it and the dialog and the bot framework can just fill in the details. Now notice that each one needs a unique name. So here I'm just using the class name. Uh, but every one of these dialogues also needs to have a unique name in order for the serialization to work. So I'm going to add the uh, add to project dialog and the build a project dialog, which is the main one that we're talking about here, and then a waterfall dialog to handle the main flow through this dialog. And that's just going to have two steps to it. The first step is going to check and see if Lewis is configured. And if we're missing the app ID or key or host name, then we're going to output a message and prompt the user to uh, fix the problem. And then we'll go on to the next step in the waterfall. Right? If we do have the Lewis information, then we'll go ahead and call Lewis and request the details. And keep in mind that what we're doing here is building up um, these consulting request details, which is the information that we need to update the billing system. Right? So Lewis will come in with some of that information, but not all of it. Now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and based on the intent that I got from Lewis, call the add to project dialog or the build to project dialog, passing in those request details. By returning the begin dialog async function, it will actually go to the next step of this dialog automatically when those child dialogs complete. On the other hand, if I fall through because I don't know the intent, then I'm going to call next async to go to the next step. And the final step is just going to check the request details. So the step context result always has the result of the previous step. So if I had the billing or the add to project dialog, if that succeeded, it would have put the result of the updated uh, request details into my step context, and then I would get that as the result. And now I can check and see what I got back. So if I got an, if I had an add to project or build a project, then there's really nothing else to do. 
If I don't have either of those, then I'm going to have to handle this by outputting a generic message. In this case, I'll, I'll use Q&A Maker to do that. So here finally is the Build to Dialog project. And you can see that it's creating quite a lot of child dialogues in its constructor, as well as a waterfall dialog that might look a little familiar. Remember the first thing we would ask for if we needed it was the project, and then we might disambiguate the project? and then ask for the time worked. Well, these are the exact steps. At the end, we're going to reconfirm, and it's always good to confirm uh, before you update the backend system, and then finalize, So, uh, which would be actually updating the backend system. So here's the first step, and we're going to come in, and the request details that we passed in are going to be in step context.options. And assuming that we got that back, um, we're going to go ahead and call a method called resolve project. Now resolve project will go back to the database and try to find projects containing the name that the user typed. If nothing comes back, then we're going to prompt the user. And here's where we're going to prompt, uh, we're going to return the dialog. So whatever this dialog does is going to move us to the next step. We're going to return this dialog, which is going to prompt the user for the project name. And you notice that here is the project name, a retry. So if we didn't get one, the prompt dialog is uh, smart enough to retry. And um, if we had one or more projects come back from Resolve Project, then we'll just go ahead and move to the next step. So as you can see, I don't have to actually send any messages back or wait for another turn. I can move to the next step of the waterfall dialog in this same turn without any interaction at all. And in this case, if we had the information we needed, there's no need for any of that interaction. So now step two is going to disambiguate the project. So we're going to go to um, get the request details again. We're going to get the result, which is um, what came back from the last um, step is going to be the project. And if the result is no, then we're going to go ahead and grab the project and call resolve project again. And if it's greater than one, we're going to ask and prompt, set up a choice prompt and say, hey, user, which one of these projects did you mean? Right? If we got exactly one project back, then we're happy and we'll just take the first one and fill all that in and um, return that now for the next step, which expects a found choice object which happens to be what the choice dialog would have responded or what we didn't need the choice dialog, what we provided here uh, in the else clause. So this is just going to kind of keep going down and each step we're going to request, we're going to see if we have a piece of data and if we don't, we're going to prompt the user and the prompt dialog will return the answer or the response back to the next step. If we do, we'll just go to the next step ourselves and pass in the result directly so that we don't actually have to interact with the user for that one. So that's how this works. It goes all the way through to the end using this method. If you want to get started with this whole approach, I recommend beginning with the core bot uh, template in either C Sharp or JavaScript or TypeScript, which actually sets up a simple Lewis model and um, a couple of waterfall dialogues to lead you through a very simplified um, airline booking. Thanks for watching this Microsoft 365 Patterns and Practices video. If you like this video, please subscribe to the Patterns and Practices YouTube channel at aka.ms slash sppnp videos. I'm Bob German. You can follow me on Twitter at bob1german and please check out my blog at bob1german.com. That's all for this time, and thanks for watching.